Good morning, and welcome to Wise Women Do. And we are all becoming wise women. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I can just feel it. It's just coming out of you. You're soaking in the word, and you're beginning to think like a wise woman and choose like a wise woman. You are becoming wise, and we are going to be so wise that we're walking down that path that leads to life, and we are going to be able to speak life onto those that we touch, those in our family, those that we interact with as we go out into the community, because we are walking on a different level. We are thinking now the thoughts of God as we're immersing our minds in his word, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish. We're looking this week at intimacy and loyalty. And as we do, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to focus in on verse 32, but we're going to start back at verse 27. And before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, how we love you and how we thank you that you have given us everything we need in Christ Jesus and in your written word that we might be wise women. Father, we thank you that all the fullness of deity dwelt in Christ, and that he literally is the very wisdom of God. And Lord, we thank you that now your spirit, the spirit of Christ, lives within us as believers and you have granted us the manifest mind of Christ. So Father, we're asking for that wisdom as your daughters this morning, that you will grant us ears to hear what your spirit is saying, that our hearts will be good, tender, and receptive soul, and that the seed of your word will be implanted in our hearts and that you, Father, will bring forth a great harvest. Lord, show us this morning any area of our flesh that needs to be taken to the cross. Anything we're depending upon instead of Christ. Lord, I thank you for your tender mercies. I thank you for how gracious and gentle you are as you expose those areas. Father, would you speak? Your daughters are listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we look at Proverbs 3, look at verse 27 and move down through 32 because this particular portion of Scripture is grouped together do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow when you have it with you now. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. For the Lord detests a perverse man but takes the upright into his confidence. And what it literally means is... He is intimate with the upright. He counts us as a friend. It's another definition or descriptive word for that particular word in the Hebrew is that it's family counsel. You know, have you ever had a family meeting where you sit down with your children and you share with them things that maybe you wouldn't share with, you know, the community at large, but you share intimate, personal family issues with them. That's what it's talking about here. God desires to be intimate in that way, to invite us into close family union. And all of us desire intimacy. But in our inward being, we're all a little afraid of being genuinely known by another for fear of being rejected. But it doesn't stop the longing. We long to be fully known and unconditionally loved. And as we know, it is only in Christ that we're able to fully experience being known and yet completely loved. God knows everything about us. In fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he still loves us. The incredible miracle that takes place when we surrender to this unconditional love is that we are set free to love others as we have longed to be loved ourselves. Did you get that? When we really grasp how much the Lord loves us, we surrender to his great love, his everlasting, never-ending love. When we surrender to his love and say, Lord, I trust you, I believe that you love me like that, then we are set free to love others the way we have longed to be loved ourselves. God sets us free from needing and drawing from others and instead allows us to, out of the overflow of having our needs for intimacy met in him, love others without condition the way he loves us. Love them regardless of how they respond. We're able to do that because that's how he loves us. In the preacher's commentary, 
He talks about this portion that we just read. He said, absence of generosity in all its forms is an abomination to the Lord. Now, we just looked at giving and generosity last week, and we heard what? That if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. And we saw that as we give, and as we give in an abundance, God blesses us. The more we give, the more God gives us so that we can continue to be a blessing, so that we have everything we need for every good deed. Remember all the superlatives we read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 last, last week? And as we looked at that we realize the more we give and the more he blesses us so that we can give more he increases our righteousness and it overflows into gratitude so we understand that our heart when it belongs completely to him will be set free not only to love but to give whatever God calls upon us to give and to be kind to our neighbor thus what did the Lord say were the two greatest commands to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then to do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. And we just read that right here. If you have what your neighbor needs, don't tell him to go when you've got it with you right now. And you can give it to him now. Care for your neighbor. That's what we are to do. And God calls these people who do not care for their neighbor perverse. They've lost their way. It may be the Hebrew's strongest term of divine abhorrence. It's an abomination to the Lord. Who cares who cares about neighborliness and community. Generosity is the way the upright, the people of rectitude and integrity live. To withhold it and hence destroy community is to choose the wrong path and literally get lost, and that's what perverse literally means. The opposite of this is to be on intimate insider terms with God so that we know what he wants and are given power to do it. Secret counsel means to be taken into his, Yahweh's, confidence. Can there be any stronger motivation to neighbor love than this? Certainly not, short of the cross. So we see God has called us to neighbor love because he loves us and he loves our neighbors. So as we represent him to a lost world, we're going to surrender to his great love for us so that we're set free to love others. And we begin to truly care about our neighbor, about our fellow believers who have needs in their life. And we want to not only pray for them, but if we're able to also meet that need. And God will give to us then secret insight. He will be intimate with us. He grants us the ability to see who God has called and created someone to be and to come alongside the Holy Spirit and help call that person forward. It literally is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Who God has hardwired someone to be will resonate with the call. They may even dare to believe that what you are saying and the Spirit is confirming in their inner man may actually be possible. Mature believers should be able to come alongside another child of God and see the best in them. The Holy Spirit allows us to see others as He sees them. And as I've grown in my relationship with Christ, He has given me great love and respect for His children, regardless of their level of maturity. I'm more interested in their story and helping them grow in their relationship with him. I desire to see them plugged into the body of Christ and utilizing their gifts for the good of the body. And as they serve, they too will grow. And it is this growth that enables us to work with God instead of for him. And as we develop this intimate relationship, our inner man is satisfied and we're able to love and meet the needs of others out of the overflow. Steve was preaching Sunday that Jesus literally had intimates. Some would go as far as to say he had favorites. But I don't believe he picks favorites the way we do. Because when we pick a favorite, what do we do? We see the girl that seems to be the most popular and is dressed the cutest. And we think, ooh, I want to be her friend. <laughs> because why? That's going to make me feel better about myself, right? <laughs> no, that's not what God does. God looks looks at the heart and God's for those who press in and want to be with them look at Peter James and John what where do you see them they're always right up there right in Jesus business aren't they they're always they're the ones saying Lord could we sit on either side of you and the right or the left when you come into your kingdom James and John Peter was the one Lord if that's you call me to come out on the water with you you see them constantly interacting pressing in wanting to be with Jesus and you know how he responds to that come on in <laughs> if you will press in and cling to him adhere to him desire to be with him and know him he wants you to know him. He will reveal himself to you. That's how God chooses his intimates. Those who are willing to obey him, those who want to spend time with him, he says, come in and let me be intimate with you. Let me reveal myself to you. So we said the Lord had intimates, but some think he may have even had a best friend in John. The reason I think John received the revelation uh, the last book of the Bible, the vision of the end times, and why God allowed him to live into his 90s and then to receive that revelation for the church, for, for believers, the followers of Jesus Christ, is because he was so surrendered to the love of the Lord. 
He believed that Jesus loved him so much he called himself that. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And Steve pointed out Sunday that five different times the book of John records that John said the disciple that Jesus loved. And he didn't even have to name himself because everybody knew. (laughs) Isn't it wonderful to feel that you're so secure in the love of Christ that everybody must know? Because the Lord loves me. And when the Lord loves you, you will be intimate with him. He will reveal himself to you and you will begin to reflect him, to look more like him, to have his heart beat, to see as he sees and to have his heart of compassion. But what about the foolish woman? You know, she spends all her time trying to please others. She isn't sure who she truly is because she's never really (laughs) sought to know. She's been so bound by fear of rejection that she's become whatever will allow her to fit in or be liked by others. Brennan Manning wrote a wonderful little book, um, Abba's child and in it he talks about how so often we have this imposter we want to put on a mask so that others don't really know us as we really are and we may take you know we have one mask on for our Sunday morning group and we have one mask on for the the Monday group that we meet at work or the Monday group that we work out with or we have a mask for each group of people because we want to be liked by them so we're almost like the chameleon Did any of you children ever have the little chameleon, little lizard that changes colors? It was so cool to be able to put them on a wall and they would become green or to put them up something else like a piece of wood and they become brown. That helps camouflage them to protect them from predators. But how often do we not do the same? We become like that chameleon. We want to change colors to fit whatever group or situation we're in. And so it's hard for us to know what we really like (laughs) or who we really are. We've got to get along with the Lord and say, God, who did you create me to be? But in his book, he says, living out of the false self creates a compulsive desire to present a perfect image to the public so that everybody will admire us and nobody will know us. The imposter's life becomes a perpetual roller coaster ride of elation and depression. The imposter is what he does. While the imposter draws his identity from past achievements and the adulation of others, the true self claims identity in its belovedness. How freeing is that when we come to the point that we're able to receive our identity from our belovedness in Christ. That because I am in Christ Jesus, I am the beloved. I am a favorite. I am an intimate with the Lord. I am one of his intimates, one of his closest followers. And how awesome that he doesn't have a limit to his intimates. To anyone who will press in, he says, come in and I will reveal myself to you. What the foolish woman doesn't realize is her lack of intimacy with Christ is causing her to become dependent on others to meet that need. It sets her up to become desperate in her actions to have this need met. If her husband isn't meeting that need, she may become like the adulterous woman we've read about in Proverbs 7 and think that another man can meet her need for intimacy. The foolish woman in Proverbs was religious. She told the young man she was trying to entice that she had paid her peace offerings in Proverbs 7, 14. She had done her duty for God and was going to live as she pleased. She then began to describe the lavish preparations she had made to ensnare him. Blinded by lust, they were both careening down the path that leads to destruction, completely unaware of their ultimate destination. And any of us can find ourselves on that path. When we are not having our need for intimacy met in Christ, we don't believe we are the beloved in Jesus, we can begin to look to other people or other things to meet that need for intimacy. And when we do, we put ourselves on that path that leads to destruction. The unfortunate truth is about lust is it never satisfies. And she was lusting and longing for intimacy, what she obviously did not have in her relationship with her husband. But she was seeking it in all the wrong ways. And what she didn't understand was the way she was seeking it now not only would lead to destruction, but to a greater loss of intimacy. A greater hunger for intimacy. A desire that would not be met on this path. Did a little research on lust because obviously it's such an issue in our culture today with all that we have at our fingertips with the internet with internets on phones and there is a company covenant eyes and if you have children in the home and you know even as adults i would encourage you to have covenant eyes put on your computer so that your children cannot go to sites 
Um, it will monitor it, and not only that, the administrator of Covenant Eyes gets a monthly report showing you a list of all the sites that have been accessed through your computer. And I know many husbands who have put it on their devices and make their wife the administrator so that they get, um, they get the, the monthly record because it's, a, it's accountability for them. But they have on their site a host of statistics about pornography. And one of them they listed was from the Barna Group. And just look at these percentages. The following percentages of men say they view pornography at least once a month. 18 to 30-year-olds, 79%. 79%. We're talking 8 out of 10 in this age bracket look at pornography at least once a month. 31 to 49-year-olds, 67%. 50 to 68-year-olds, 49%. The following percentages of men say they view pornography at least several times a week. 18 to 30-year-olds, 63%, several times a week. 31 to 49-year-olds, 38%. 50 to 68-year-olds, 25%. The following percentages of women say they view pornography at least once a month. 18 to 30-year-olds, 76%. It's just 3% lower than the men. 31 to 49-year-olds, 16%. 50 to 68-year-olds, 4%. What does that tell us about this next generation? The following percentages of women say they view pornography at least several times a week. 18 to 30-year-olds, 21%, obviously significantly lower there. 31 to 49-year-olds, 5%. 50 to 68-year-olds, 0%. 55% of married men say they watch porn at least once a month compared to 70% of not married men. And I think one of the only reasons the women's percentage is smaller is because they don't typically are not stimulated by the visual of pornography like men are, but they lose themselves in sometimes pornographic romance novels. So we need to be very careful that we're guarding our hearts and our minds, that we don't put ourselves on that path that leads to destruction, because we need to understand the law of diminishing returns. And that is why pornography becomes an addiction that is a compulsion that destroys marriages, relationships, and can even cause people to lose their jobs because they are so addicted to pornography. It is because the initial stimulation, the initial excitement they receive from the first time they watch it diminishes so that they need to watch it more often and more often it becomes more and more perverse. We also need to understand that the things we continue to play out in our mind will eventually be acted out. And that is why we have had an increase in rapes, child molestation, and all that goes with this perverse package of the evil one whose goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. So as I'm telling you, we must protect our minds, our lives, our families. We've got to be on guard. We must fight for them in prayer, but also in purity in our own lives. According to sociologist Jill Manning, and this is also from Covenant Eyes Research, the research indicates pornography consumption is associated with the following six trends, among others. These are just six of the trends. Increased marital distress and risk of separation and divorce. Decreased marital intimacy and sexual satisfaction. See, the exact opposite of what they're thinking. They're thinking it's going to increase their satisfaction, but it doesn't. It, it perverts it. It distorts it, so it decreases the satisfaction in their marital relationship. An increase in infidelity, increased appetite for more graphic types of pornography and sexual activity associated with abusive, illegal, or unsafe practices, devaluation of monogamy, marriage, and child rearing, an increasing number of people struggling with compulsive and addictive sexual behavior. It is crippling an entire generation. And it breaks my heart because I believe we as the church not only need to be well informed, but we're also going to need to be equipped to be able to help some of these young couples, especially these young men, deal with these compulsive behaviors, these strongholds, and be set free from them. To refuse the lies of the evil one and replace it with the truth. But you know, you only do that <clears throat> if you know the truth. And so often, even believers open their Bible on Sunday morning when they come to church, and that's only if they have a preacher who actually teaches the Word, but they open their Bible on Sunday morning and it's closed and it's not opened again until the next Sunday when they try to think, now where did I lay that down when I came home last Sunday? And they pick it up to take it back with them. There's no way you can accurately protect your mind from the onslaught from our world and our culture and your own flesh if you're not immersing yourself in the Word of God. We battle 
the enemy with the word, just like Jesus Christ, the only sinless one, did. We refute the lies with, it is written. And that is the only way you can refute and win. <laughs> it is written. Okay, if she's not moving into a, an illicit affair with another man, it may be that she gets very dependent upon a good girlfriend. And when that happens, she'll become exclusive in this friendship and jealous of anyone else who might take away the attention of this friend. Though most of us may not feel tempted by homosexuality, I believe the evidence is strong that we are tempted by dependency. An emotionally dependent relationship produces bondage. And that's from Dee Breston's book, The Friendships of Women. And it has been redone. I read it probably 20 years ago. I thought it was wonderful then. Um, but she has actually redone it. It's just been re-released. It is an excellent book. I would highly recommend it. Um, but I looked up codependent. Do you know what it is? An addictive dependence on the needs of or controlled by another. It's literally a psychological condition. That's the definition. That's the medical definition of it. And we hear about codependency all the time. We don't even think that much about it. But it's being dependent upon another person so much so that you can't function without them. The only person we're to be that dependent upon is Jesus Christ. And when we're dependent upon him and we say, Lord, I can't. What does he say in John 15? You can do nothing apart from me. When we realize we really can do nothing apart from him, he sets us free to do all kinds of other things. <laughs> but we must first let him have that place of preeminence. Matthew Henry in his commentary said, The righteous therefore have no reason to envy the evildoers, for they have God's secret with them. They're his favorites. He has that communion with them which is a secret to the world and in which they have a joy that a stranger does not intermeddle with. He communicates to them the secret tokens of his love. His covenant is with them. They know his mind and the meanings and intentions of his providence better than others can. Nothing surpasses that. Walking with the Lord like that, experiencing that intimacy with him, becoming one of his favorites literally is the pearl of great price that in the parable in the New Testament, the man was willing to sell everything he had to purchase that pearl. And I want to tell you, there is nothing in your life more important than your personal intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you grasp that truth and you literally make him by your actions, your time, setting your affections upon him, when you make him the most important person in your life, I promise you from personal experience, the other things will fall in place. God will take care of all the other things in your life that maybe have burdened you or held you captive in the past. He will set you free. And as you're intimate with him and you walk in that intimacy and you let him love you in your deepest, the deepest part of your being, he loves you all the way to the core of who you are and changes us from the inside out. And when you when you literally surrender to that love, he enables you to be loyal because he is completely and totally loyal and faithful. He is so faithful and loyal to fulfill his word. And any commitment he makes to us, he follows through on. He will not let one of his words return void. Look at the passage in Proverbs 4. Let's look at 6 through 8. This is from the voice translation. If you don't forsake Lady Wisdom, she will protect you. Love her and she will faithfully or loyally take care of you. And that literally means to cling or adhere to her. Gaining sound judgment is key. So first things first, go after Lady Wisdom. Now whatever else you do, follow through to understanding. Cherish her and she will help you rise above the confusion of life. Your possibilities will open up before you. Embrace her and she will raise you to a place of honor in return. The Lord is the one who exalts one and puts down another. And as you honor and revere him and love him, he will exalt you and use you in ways you haven't even begun to dream of. But he will open doors of effective service for you. There's no way you could have opened. And he desires to do that with those who will walk intimately with him. And he will be loyal to you. In fact, Matthew Henry says of the passage in chapter 4, 1 through 13, he says, so plainly, so pressingly is the case laid before us that we shall be forever inexcusable if we perish in our folly. <laughs> He's saying God has given us everything we need to live wisely. And it is our own fault if we perish in our folly because we have chosen not to listen to the truth of God's word. So we must understand God is loyal and he faithfully cares for those who seek him. His life in us helps us to be loyal to his word and his plan. He is a covenant-keeping God. And he has made covenant with us through Jesus Christ. He is always faithful to his word. And when we look at a couple of instances of loyalty in, in the Bible, I immediately think of Ruth and Naomi, and I also think of David and Jonathan. And when you look at Ruth and Naomi, what do you think about? In fact, with, 
with both of these friendships, first and foremost was their love for and reverence for the Lord. When you see Ruth and Naomi, Ruth saw in Naomi and her family a love for and devotion to the God of Israel. And she saw the reality of this God and recognized he alone was God. And when she makes her beautiful profession of faith and commitment to Naomi, she also commits herself to Naomi's God. And she's willing to leave her homeland, her people, her culture, everything she knows and follow Naomi, who wasn't even exactly that thrilled that she was willing to go, back to Bethlehem so that she can be a part of Naomi's people and she can worship Naomi's God. She made a beautiful, beautiful statement of faith. And so we see first and foremost, she loved the Lord. She had committed herself to him so fully, she was willing to leave everything she knew and follow Naomi to a place that she did not know. She only knew through her. And God protected her. And we have the beautiful picture of the kinsman redeemer through Boaz, which is a picture of Christ being our kinsman redeemer and Ruth's willingness to listen to the instruction of Naomi and to do exactly what she told her to do and how God honored her submission and how he honored her obedience and he blessed her and protected her and she's grafted into the very lineage of Jesus Christ. But we see here a friendship, a loyalty that nothing could come between these two women. And it wasn't because of Naomi's loyalty initially. It was because of Ruth's. It was her commitment to be faithful to Naomi. Well, what about with David and Jonathan? The first time that Jonathan sees David that we're aware of is just after David has slain Goliath. And he's holding his ugly head and he comes back to present it to King Saul, Jonathan's father. And what does he recognize? Because I believe Jonathan loved the Lord and he walked with the Lord. He recognized God's hand of anointing upon David. And he literally took his robe off. And put it on David. And he committed himself to him from that day. Why? First and foremost, because he recognized and revered the Lord. And he understood God's hand was on David. And instead of contending with him out of jealousy, he committed himself to him as a leader. Recognizing that God's anointing was upon him and committed himself to him. And do you know what I believe he appreciated about David? What do we know about David? And this is something that Dee Breston brings out in her book, The Friendships of Women. We are drawn, and she said she is drawn, to poets and giant slayers. Isn't that true? And David was both of those. Aren't you drawn to somebody who who sees deeper than the surface? Who asks deep penetrating questions? Who feels with a greater compassion maybe than you feel? Because they challenge you to think more deeply and, and to impact the Lord on a deeper, more intimate level. But giant slayers are the ones who do just like David and they say, Who are you, you Philistine, to come against the army of the living God? We are followers of the living God. There is not a circumstance, a situation that is impossible for him. Every one of us as believers, as intimates of the Lord Jesus Christ should be giant slayers. And you know what? It's going to differ depending upon where God has placed you and what giants he's allowed you to encounter. But whatever giant it may be, you can stand before it in the name of Jesus Christ and you can be a giant slayer. You can go forward with what God has called you to do and to be regardless of what the enemy throws up against you because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. More are those who are with us than those who are with them. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we begin to think truth, ladies, we become wise. And we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only will God begin to speak to us, but he will begin to call us to great exploits for our king. And we will do them in his name and by his power for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. And God, I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ that you will bless every woman in this room, every woman who listens to this by video or podcast. God, I'm asking that you will spark within us a desire to be one of your intimates and that we will press in and we will surrender our lives, everything about us, to your great, unending, everlasting, unconditional love. And God, I'm asking that as we do, you will show us what you've called us to accomplish for your name's sake. That we will be wise women. Women who feel and hear and experience you. And who go out into the world as giant slayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.